What a great day to be in the Lord's house. I've been looking forward to today, as I trust you have as well. I, uh, I'm finding that as I get older, the days go by quicker. But I honestly, honestly look forward to Sunday like no other day of the week. I really do. Uh, it's just a, a great day to reflect over the past week, remind myself of God's blessings, and also the fact that I, I love it when the Word of God tells me that where two or three are gathered together in His name, there am I to be found in the midst of them. How many of you sense the presence of the Lord here today? I just sense that God is uh, you know, just waiting for us to really step out in uncharted territory. And I want to encourage you from the very outset of the message this morning, allow God to speak to you through His Word. Believe God for the impossible. Will you do that? What, what is the need that you have pressing on your heart today? What is it that you need God to do for you? And say, Lord, would you just say this with me? Lord, today, by faith, I am expecting an encounter with you like never before. I believe with all of my heart that the desire of my heart is going to be met and fulfilled in you as your glory and your presence is manifested in this place today. To God be all glory. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise God. Today I want to speak to you on a very practical theme. And it's weeding life's garden. Weeding life's garden. How many of you like to weed? Wow, I see two or three of you, and I'm not sure about the two or three of you. You don't need to be the first ones to the altar when I'm done. <laughs> weeding is no fun. You agree with me? I mean, I, I have weeded many, many times, and uh, as I've ventured out, and, uh, you know, I've seen a weed here or a weed there or whatever, it never ceases to amaze me that you'll notice one or two weeds, but as you begin weeding, you discover more. And it's an endless task, it's an endless chore as you really pay close attention because if you're like I am, many mornings I walk out the door, I don't even look back. I mean, I'm, you know, I've got a one-track mind. I'm, the minute I walk out the door, I take off my dad hat, I take off my husband hat, if you will, for the time being, and I'm headed to the church. I'm thinking about church things, I'm thinking about things that I have to do. Now, when I get home in the evening, I take off my pastor's hat as much as I'm able to and put on my dad hat, my husband hat, and so on and so forth. Uh, but again, many times, I hurry in the door and, and don't really notice or am not really attentive to the, the things around the home that need to be done. But you know, a few years ago, I discovered something about weeds. I was busy tending to our flower garden and discovered that what appeared to be several weeds were spread out over a large area there in my flower bed. So I began to pull out the nearest one only to discover that it was connected to the next nearest plant. And as I went on to that one, I discovered that it was connected to the next nearest plant. And as I discovered that it was connected to the next nearest plant, and so on and so forth. And in all, I probably had about 30 weeds that were sprouting up in two different directions from the plant that I had started with. But I discovered that in the middle of them was a big bundle of roots, if you will, like a ball of roots. And this was the seedbed, if you will, of all these other weeds. And what it had done is it had sent out tentacles or it had sent out sprouts. And each one of those tentacles or each one of those sprouts had the ability of producing a new weed. So even though I thought I had like 30 or 40 weeds in my flower bed, actually it was one culprit. Now I had a choice to make. I could either go ahead and dig up my flower bed and get to the source of the problem because it was deeply ingrained and the shoots that were coming off of it were also buried underneath. But to my dismay, just a, a, a few weeks earlier, I had paid a professional landscaper to come in and lay down the cloth that's supposedly to keep the weeds out of your yard, you know, from sprouting up in the first place. And uh, on top of that, I had laid down about two to three inches of mulch, which had taken me most of the day to do. And the idea of pulling up all that mulch and pulling up all that uh, ground cover and getting to the source of the problem was too much. So guess what I opted to do? I opted to go ahead and take care of the weeds I could see, shoot some Roundup, Roundup rather, down into that hole, and just say, take my chances. Well, you know, the truth of the matter is this. When we're faced with a decision that we can either live with or we can dig up the entire area of our lives, a lot of times we choose the easy way out, don't we? 
And it really caused me to question my motive because how many times in my spiritual walk do I take the easy way out rather than dealing with the core of the matter? You see, I was guilty of ignoring it. I was guilty of working around it where I had to. And if I'm completely honest with you, I was guilty of trading what was best for what was serviceable. And I sometimes wonder if we're not guilty of doing the same thing in our Christian walk of faith. I want you to turn with me this morning to Paul's letter to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapter 7. We want to look together at verses 9 through 11. And I'm going to ask if you'd be kind enough to stand with me in the reverence of reading God's word. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, we want to look together at verses 9, 10, and 11. I'm going to ask if you would please to read verse 10 when we get to it. But notice Paul says this to the church of Corinth. He says, now I rejoice, not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For observe this very thing, that you sorrowed in a godly manner. What diligence it produced in you, what clearing of yourselves, what indignation, what fear, what vehement desire, what zeal, what vindication. In all things you proved yourselves to be clear in this matter. Now, the thing that we want to focus on this morning is this. Weeding life's garden, but looking at it in the fact that I am weeding out sinful practices. I am weeding out sinful habits. I'm weeding out those deep embedded roots of sin that are in my life that I have seen manifested in many different ways, the outshoots of it, if you will, and I've dealt with such things as gossip. I've dealt with such things as lying. I've dealt with such things as cheating and, you know, all the different things that go along with that. But have I really dealt with the core of the matter and gotten to the root of the problem, the root of sin that is still embedded in my life. Yes, I've come to the altar. Yes, I've prayed a prayer of repentance. But have I really had godly repentance? How many of you would agree with me there's a difference between godly repentance and just plain repentance? Godly repentance will reveal to me my need of having a hatred for sin like God has a hatred for sin. And Quite frankly, my friend, until I have a hatred for sin and you have a hatred for sin the way that God does, we'll never really deal with sin the way that it needs to be dealt with. You agree with me? So that's where we're coming from this morning. And I pray that you'll give God your your best attention. Listen intently to his word. Let God search you out. And friend, I can't emphasize to you enough how much I believe that God wants to do something in our midst today as we open our lives and become transparent before him. Heavenly Father, we need you today. We need you to speak to us. God, I'm your vessel. I I stand here, Lord, uh, not because I'm worthy, not because I'm anyone special, but Lord, because the call was placed upon my life. And Lord, I, I need you desperately. I pray, Holy Spirit, that you'll walk before me into this pulpit. I pray that you'll anoint my lip, my mind afresh. I pray, God, that the words that come forth will be your words. May they indeed, oh God, fall upon fertile soil. And Lord, I just sense in my spirit today that today is a day of new beginnings. Today is a day of deliverance. Today is a day of victory if we will step out in faith and recognize what our God can and will do for us if we'll be a people of action. Not just hearers of the word, but doers of the word. So Lord, you orchestrate. Help me to know when to get out of your way. Help me to know when to quit and allow you to do the rest. In Jesus' name I pray and we'll give you all praise and all of God's people said, amen, amen. As I said earlier, in our lives, we have a choice. We have the choice of totally eliminating the weed or the root of sin from our lives, or we can choose to live with it. And we can ignore it. We can work around it. We can walk around it. We can pretend like it isn't there. But if we do so, we're guilty of trading what is best for what is convenient. Are we at times guilty of settling for what is serviceable? instead of striving for what is best? Scriptures often force me to ask this question. For instance, the scripture passage I read at the beginning of the message this morning. How often, 
How often do we just read scripture without listening for God to speak to us through his word? 2 Corinthians was actually the fourth letter that Paul had written to the church here at Corinth. And his letter writing, writing rather had begun because false teachers had crept into the midst of the church, charging Paul with being a phony, a scam artist. Paul actually made a trip to Corinth after his second letter that we know as 1 Corinthians, and he wasn't treated very well by the church. They laughed him out of town and refused to recognize his apostolic authority. Paul again wrote a third letter. The one this passage references was a hard letter, a no-nonsense letter. We don't have a record of it in Holy Scripture, but Paul refers to it here in what we know as his fourth letter, 2 Corinthians. And Paul says something rather remarkable in this passage here in verses 8 through 10, something that at first really grates on our senses. Pay attention if you would. 2 Corinthians 7, 8 says, For even if I made you sorry with my letter, I do not regret it. For I perceive that the same epistle made you sorry, though only for a while. Verse 9, Now I rejoice not that you were made sorry, but that your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner, that you might suffer loss from us in nothing. For godly sorrow produces repentance, leading to salvation, not to be regretted, but the sorrow of the world produces death. Friend, I want you to understand today, the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. Amen? And I want you to understand this morning that even though sometimes preaching may be hard to hear, even though when I'm confronted with the truth of God's word, it may be something that, that is, is dealing with me, it may be something that I enjoy doing, it might be something that is indeed holding me back from being the best person that I need to be for God, and I'm, I'm kind of weighing my options as to see how close to the world I can live and yet still make it into heaven, but I want you to understand this morning, I'll never be the person of God, you'll never be the person of God, until you are totally sold out to the cause of Christ. Anytime I leave a segment of sin still present in my life and do not allow the Lord to be the master of it all and do not allow the Lord to have complete control of me, there is always the potential of that problem taking root and setting out other shoots and manifesting itself in other ways. And until you and I become honest with God and I really determine for myself, who is really my Lord? Who is really my master? Whom am I really serving? Doesn't it tell me in the book of Matthew chapter 6 that no man can serve two masters for either he'll love the one and cling to the other? Isn't that what it says? Doesn't it say that you're going to have a divided heart? And may I submit to you this morning in humility but in truthfulness at the same time, I believe that one of the biggest concerns that is confronting the 21st century church is that we're having a hard time deciding who is our true master. Who am I really honestly desiring to serve wholeheartedly, unashamedly? Am I willing to take a stand for Jesus Christ? I want you to understand this morning something, this, my friend. As I look around and I see what's happening in the world and with this ISIS movement and Hamas and so on and so forth and this, 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 uh, you know, this, this militant Islamic movement that is uh, so strongly rising its head and whatever, they are sold out for their cause. I submit to you this morning, it's the time of the season for the church of Jesus Christ to be sold out for the sake of the gospel of Christ Jesus. Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. I am not ashamed to boldly proclaim that Jesus Christ alone is the truth, the life, and the way. There is no other way to Father God other than through his only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, who died on the cross, who paid the debt for my sin and yours, rose again on the third day, ascended to the Father's right hand, and one day is coming back for his bride, the church of Jesus Christ. It's a day I can't wait for, and I will never renounce his name. We need to be as bold for the cause of the gospel. We need to be as sold out for the cause of Christ as much as the Muslim Brotherhood is for their belief in Muhammad and in Allah. I submit to you this morning that it's time that the church of Jesus Christ awakens. So Paul made no apology for pointing out the shortcomings in the church of Corinth. He wrote to them in love. He wrote to them as a father. He wrote to them with, with a corrective spirit rather than with a punishment. He was not out to punish them, but rather he was out to correct them and help them to see the errors of their way. And friend, I submit to you this morning humbly that the devil is very subtle in presenting the desires of this world to us that the church is compromised in many areas. And it is 
causing us to not have the effect on the world that Jesus Christ desires for us to have. So if we will step out in boldness, we need to understand that Paul says, even though my letter made you sorry, your sorrow led to repentance. For you were made sorry in a godly manner in that it wasn't me, but it was the Holy Spirit working through me that pointed out to you the things that you needed to repent of and let go of and allow change to take place in your life. I want to encourage you this morning that no matter how close to God you may be walking, no matter how close to God I may be walking, there's always room for improvement. Amen? There's always room for improvement in my life and in yours. You know, when we look at this, you have to kind of do a double take. Did Paul just say that God intended to make the Corinthians sorrowful? Such a notion sort of shocks the system. You see, the same God who spoke tenderly to a downtrodden Israel in the clutches of Babylonian captivity, where he said there in Jeremiah 29, I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and hope, is the same God who had been responsible for bringing that sorrow on Israel in the first place. Why? To instruct them in ways of righteousness and in ways of justice. They had continuously rebelled against his commandments and had repeatedly fallen into idolatry and into a sinful lifestyle. And God had sent prophet after prophet after prophet to them, trying to point out to them the errancy, the errancy of their ways and, and to point out to them their need of repentance and turning back to God. But they had turned a deaf ear. Pride had crept in. They had prospered. They had done well. And, and they no longer needed God. Sounds like today, doesn't it? We don't need God. We're, we're self-sufficient. We can do this by ourselves. We're too smart for God. We're too rich for God. We don't need God. I mean, after all, we're the, we're the superpower in the world. We're this, we're that, whatever. Friends, may I submit to you, God exalts a nation to a position of prestige, and he also brings them down. History bears that out time after time after time. And I would humbly submit to you this morning that as America, we are living on borrowed time. We are. God is merciful, and thank God he is. Thank God he's a God of grace, and, and I can't thank him enough for that. But I am imploring the church of Jesus Christ. It's time for us to awaken, and it's time for us to be the church of God that God has set us apart to be. God wanted to show them and to see how intensely he hates sin among his people, and to unveil his holiness when they realized this, it brought them to a place of repentance, the prelude to holiness. That is what Paul was referring to when he says that he was made happy by the Corinthians' sorrow. Not that he hurt them, but rather that their sorrow led to repentance. He was glad to know that they could still recognize grace, even when it came in the form of sorrow. When was the last time that you and that I recognized God's grace through sorrow. The sorrow that comes when we realize that we've been called to holiness. And if I'm honest with you and you're honest with me, many times in my life, I'm anything less than holy. That's not easy for me to stand here and admit to you. But if I'm totally honest with you, there have been times in my life where I have been less than holy. I've not been the man of God. And if you're a lady here today, you've not been the woman of God that God has called you to be. The sorrow that comes from realizing that you and I have fallen short of the glory of God and it is only His grace that can make up the difference. I see something in our text that suggests to me that there's a lot more to repentance than is often being taught in the Christian church today. Paul says that their sorrow has led to a godly sorrow which brings repentance that leads to salvation. Now, I don't know about you, but when I step back and I realized that Paul was writing this letter not to a bunch of sinners, but to Christians. He wasn't writing this to some nightclub. He wasn't writing this to some brothel. He wasn't writing this, you know, to some sinful uh, sinners or whatever, but rather he was writing this to a bunch of Christians. Why would Paul use such language? Well, Paul understood salvation in terms of a process, he reveals this when he tells the Philippians to work out their salvation with fear and trembling. You see, it's, it's not an automatic. 
It's not a one-time thing of, of coming a prayer of repentance and then that's all there is to it. I come, I ask Christ for forgiveness of my sins and then I can go and do anything that I want to. But it's a lifelong process of working out my salvation with fear and trembling. As I grow, as I mature in my Christian walk and I begin to understand the plan that God has for my life and the changes that God is interested in doing and performing in my life, that rather than kicking against the Lord and rebelling against the Lord, I willfully submit my will to his and I walk in obedience and faith in the areas that I need help in, in knowing that when I am weak, he is strong. Now, when I can't do it in my own strength, in my own wisdom, that's when God divinely intervenes. For him, speaking of Paul, salvation included sanctification. Paul realized that living a life of holiness didn't happen by just praying a sinner's prayer. But rather, walking in holiness begins with repentance. My friend, repentance is a lifetime discipline necessary for a holy life. I'm going to say that again. Repentance is a lifetime discipline necessary for a holy life. True repentance requires that we realize that we have disobeyed God. We have violated his law, offended his moral purity, we have cast off his yoke of authority. It only happens when we stop deceiving ourselves that what we are doing is not so bad when compared with others around us. May I submit to you this morning that rather than comparing yourself to those around you, compare yourself to the Lord Jesus Christ. It doesn't take long for me to realize how short I've fallen of being the man of God that God would have me to be when I start comparing myself to him and then when I start reading my Bible and I find out what God says is possible for that one that will walk in obedience and complete trust in the Lord and do things his way rather than my way, it, it never ceases to amaze me when I see what I can be and hopefully it bursts within you a desire to become the person that you can be. You've heard this before, it's nothing new. I thank God I'm not the man that I used to be, but I'm also thankful that God isn't finished with me and I'm not the man that I can be as I walk a walk of obedience and complete faith in the Lord. I'm not happy with where I'm at, but praise God, I'm a work in process. And as long as I am that clay that's available to the potter, he can mold me, he can form me, he can remove the impurities at any time. And even though it's not a pleasant process, I know that God has my best interest in mind. Can you say amen? When you understand that God is out to bless you, rather than to harm you, and the thoughts that he has toward you lead to a good end, it's a no-brainer as far as who I want to be the master of my life. You see, true repentance only happens when we stop deceiving ourselves, that what we're doing is not so bad. May I remind you that God is not concerned about degrees of sin. He's concerned about sin. God is not concerned about degrees of sin. He's concerned about sin. You and I have a tendency to list in priority how bad sins are, don't we? Well, gossip's not as bad as murder. In God's eyes, it is. Sin is sin. I have a tendency to grade sin. God does not. And if I understand my Bible correctly, when I read the Word of God, it tells me something that's tragic about sin, and that is that sin separates me from the presence of the Lord. And I do never, ever want God's presence to be removed from my life. I pray that you don't either. You see, the gossiper is just as guilty in the eyes of God as the murderer we have to get past our tendency to re re relativize our sin and admit that we are doing wrong and then be quick to repent of it. True repentance requires a godly sorrow. And we need to realize that when we have done something wrong, we've dishonored God. And may I be quick to point out to you that rather than running away from God when you've made a mistake, be quick to run to him. 
Don't be afraid of him. Know that your God is a patient God. Know that your God is a loving God. Know that your God is quick to forgive when you call out in a spirit of true repentance and you really desire to be that person that is set apart in holiness, in service to the Lord. And understand that God has your best interest in mind. So don't run away from him. Run to him and accept his forgiveness. Because when I carry around unrepented sin, God has no choice because of his holiness and because of his purity but to punish sin. He doesn't want to punish the sinner. He wants to punish sin. But when sin is repented of, praise God, I'm no longer a sinner saved by grace, but I am a saint that still sins. Do you understand the difference? I mean, I don't know about you, but I I have problems when I hear somebody saying I'm a sinner saved by grace. Oh, I agree with that, and I'm not going to get into a theological argument with you over that. Yes, we are all sinners, and yes, we are all saved by grace. But you know what? The moment that I asked Jesus Christ into my life and I decided to follow the Lord, I don't think of myself as a sinner. I think of myself as a saint that still sins. Now, you may say, well, pastor, you're, you're making a play on words or whatever. Look, friends, I believe in dwelling on the positive rather than the negative. I have enough negativity in my life. The devil beats me up enough. And when he goes around telling me that I'm a sinner, I know that only too well. But I am a person that is desiring to be set apart in service to the Lord and to serve him to the best of my ability. And even though I'm not growing wings in a halo and ready to be, you know, translated at any time into heaven because of being such a good person, I am a saint in the fact that I have received Jesus Christ in my life. And I I am a child of the Most High God. Hallelujah. And I want to remind you of that. When Satan tries to get you down, when Satan tries to rob you of the delivering power of Jesus Christ, when he tries to tell you you're not worthy of it, understand this morning that you are a child of God. You've got royal blood flowing through your veins. If you were honest and sincere when you came forward and asked Christ for forgiveness of your sins and your true heart's desire is to serve him to the best of your ability, you are one day going to stand in the very presence of God himself. Praise his name. So true repentance requires a godly sorrow. We need to realize that when we've done something wrong, we've dishonored God. And this only happens when we take seriously that God hates sin. He can't tolerate it. He must judge it because he's holy, because he's pure. Heaven will not be heaven if sin is there. Do you get it? There's no room for sin in heaven. It won't be heaven. If sin makes its way into heaven, it will no longer be heaven. That's why even the smallest of sins, of transgressions, will not find their place there. God must purge it out of our lives. Hear me this morning. If the cross teaches us nothing else, and it certainly does, it tells us how much God hates sin. If the cross teaches us nothing else, and it certainly does, it tells us how much God hates sin. And may I submit to you this morning that if God hates sin, so should you and so should I. We've coddled it. We've, we've compromised. We've, we've, we've kind of treated it like a little pet. And we, and we keep it over in its corner and we pull it out and we play with it from time to time. And, and then we put it back in its box and put it away and act like it's not there. But friends, it's so deceptive. And sin leads to death. When we realize how nonchalantly we engage in sinful activity, we suddenly realize how unlike Christ we really are. We see the price that he paid for us and how easily we cast it aside for a momentary indulgence. But oh, if you're like I am, and I'm just being honest with you, when I allow myself to compromise and engage in it for just a moment or two, I find out that it's not long till I'm enticed back to it. And then I'm enticed back to it again. And before I realize it, it has control of me rather than me controlling it. Am I being honest? Am I speaking the truth? Friends, we need to recognize it for what it is. We need to give it no room in our lives. If we're going to be all that God wants us to be, then we must have a clear vision of who we are and what changes need to take place in our lives. I want to ask you this morning, How many of you, when you got up this morning to get ready for church, looked in the mirror? Okay. Some of you didn't raise your hands. We'll be nice and pretend like you look good, okay? I'm teasing. If you're like I am, 
there's a lot of times when I look in the mirror and I want to scream in fright. How my wife could ever wake up beside of me for 38 years in the morning is beyond me. I don't like what I see a lot of times. You know what I'm talking about. Your breath smells like you ate a bunch of ramps before you went to sleep. I don't know who he is, but one of these times I'm going to wake up. There's somebody that takes a handful of Vaseline and runs through my hair in the middle of the night. It's sticking in 25 different directions. You know what I'm talking about. I bumped into our realtor here some time back, and I was teasing her. Her name is Sarah. I said, Sarah, I said, I have a complaint against you. She said, what? And she, you know, she thought I was serious. She said, well, what are you talking about? I said, you didn't tell me when we bought this house, I think at the time it was like 12 years, I said, you didn't tell me the time we bought this house 12 years ago that there was some old gray-haired fat guy that lived there. She said, what, what are you talking about? I said, this morning when I got up and I went into my bathroom and I looked in the mirror, there was some old fat gray-haired guy looking back at me in the mirror and he wasn't there 12 years ago. It's a scary sight sometimes, isn't it, what you see when you look in the mirror. But I believe that a very serious question that we need to ask ourselves is this. Who is that person in the reflection? Who is that person on the other side of the mirror looking back at us? None of us, if we're honest can see ourselves as clearly as we should because we're all guilty of having blind spots, aren't we? Oh, I can pick out your faults. I can pick out your imperfections. But me? Oh, no, you got to be kidding. I'm perfect. You know? I'm not this. I'm not that. But in reality, I am. We need to look into the perfect mirror of God's word and see the real person that we are. James tells us in his epistle how we should look into a mirror. In James 1, beginning with verse 21 down through verse 25, it says this. It says, Therefore, lay aside all filthiness and overflow of wickedness, and receive with meekness the implanted word, which is able to save your souls. But be doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. For he observes himself, goes away, and immediately forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in it, and is not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the work, this one will be blessed in what he does. Let me tell something very practical here. Any of you men ever cut yourself shaving in the morning? Okay, a few of you have. Well, I'm notorious for it. And I still am a country bumpkin. I still use a piece of tissue paper to put on the cut, the nick, you know, whatever, to keep it from bleeding. I know that I have cut myself. I know that I have taken a piece of tissue paper and put on that cut. But you know what I sometimes forget? To take it off. And when my wife was still teaching school, she would leave earlier than I would. I didn't have anybody at home to tell me, Jeff or Dad, you still have a piece of tissue paper on your face. And I would go out and I'd be walking around and I would have a piece of tissue paper on my face and Steve would never tell me about it and Melinda would never tell me about it or anybody else. And here I was walking around with these pieces of tissue paper on my face where I'd nick myself shaving, you know, thinking that everything was fine. And then when I would go into the bathroom and look in the mirror, I would think, oh my goodness. And I would think back over all the places I had been and what have you and whatever. Well, you know what? Can I, can I just submit to you this morning in a spiritual sense? How many times am I guilty of coming into the house of the Lord, the Sunday morning service, just like this? And the truth of God's word is being preached. The Holy Spirit is dealing with me about issues in my life. And I've got spiritual nicks, if you will. Sin, that, that root problem that we were talking about earlier that has a way of sending out tentacles, that has a way of, you know, sending out sprouts that are very capable of producing other manifestations of sin in my life. And the Holy Spirit is pointing them out to me and they're saying, Jeff, don't worry about this sprout over here. Don't worry about this sprout over here. Get to the source of the problem. 
And I'm sitting in the worship service. God's dealing with me. I feel the urgency to get to the altar and make things right with God or whatever. But when the altar call is given, I resist the urging of God's spirit. I don't deal with it. And when I walk out the door, I'm like I am with the tissue on my face. I've completely forgotten about it because the spiritual mirror is no longer there showing me the needs that need to be repented of and taken care of by God's grace and God's love. Friend, I believe with every fiber of my being this morning that God is wanting to raise up a people that will be holy, pure in his sight. Not that we're perfect, but that we're striving for it. I'm still going to make mistakes. I'm still going to fail. I'm still going to fall. And I'm not making excuses. I'm just being honest. Not because I want to, but because I'm still in this fleshly body. And I'm still going to fall short from time to time. But I have a God who loves me. You have a God who loves you. And he's not going to be quick to condemn you when you make a mistake. He's not going to be quick to, to you know, give up on you and walk away. But rather, he's going to be standing there with arms of love and arms of grace, reaching out to you, desiring that you'll repent of your shortcomings and have birth within you the desire to be the person of God that he would have you to be. I humbly submit to you this morning that it's time that we weed, we weed our spiritual garden. When you look in the mirror, do you like what you see? Or would you be like me and can say, oh God, there are some things that I need to work on and with the help of your Holy Spirit, God, I'm not gonna be quick to forget. I'm not gonna just have them pointed out to me. But God, I want them to be removed. I'm tired of playing games, God. I, I'm tired of, of, you know, walking into church and when the word comes forth, feeling convicted and whatever, and then when I walk out, I quickly forget about it. But today, God, I sense in my heart, I sense in my spirit that you're wanting to meet with me one-on-one, and God, I want to be that person that is set apart in service to you. I want to be a part of that bride that's without spot, that's without wrinkle, that when you return, that, Lord, there's no doubt in my mind I'm going to rise to meet you in the air and spend an eternity with you. So important for us to understand. You know, we all can quote probably from memory John 3.16. But you know John 3.17? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Did you hear what I said? For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. That's the kind of a God that we serve. He doesn't wink at sin. He doesn't ignore sin. As I said earlier in my sermon, he hates sin, but he does not hate the sinner. And there's a difference, isn't there? There's a difference. So rather than running away from God, when you feel his convicting spirit dealing with you, when you are looking in his word, and it's that spiritual mirror that is showing you issues in your life, Weeds in your spiritual garden that need to be weeded rather than ignoring them, rather than dealing with the little things. Let's get to the root of the problem and recognize that the little things are connected, that when you start pulling out one weed, it's connected to the next weed and the next weed, like I discovered when I was weeding my flower bed, and it all had one source, and that's sin. Only a perfect mirror can give a perfect image. And the only perfect image is Jesus Christ. Nothing else. I'm going to say that again. Only a perfect mirror can give a perfect image. And the only perfect image is Jesus. How do I measure up? How do you measure up when we look in the mirror? Are there imperfections? Are there things there that are keeping me from being my best for the Lord? If so, there's no better time than today to begin weeding life's garden and allow Jesus Christ to be the Lord of all. Would you bow your head with me in prayer, please? God, I've done my best to bring forth your word uncompromisingly, truthfully, and hopefully, Lord, in a way that will challenge us to do some spiritual introspection. I believe today, Holy Spirit, that you're speaking to hearts 
God, you're challenging us, and I pray that we won't turn a deaf ear. And I pray that we won't be guilty of just being hearers of your word, but Lord, may we take action. May we be doers. Today, Lord, I believe that your Holy Spirit is wanting to search us out to reveal to us as we're open, as we're transparent, as we're honest. You're wanting to do spiritual surgery. You're wanting to get to the root of the problem rather than just the symptom. Today, Lord, may you begin a work here at HFA. Begin it in my life, Lord, and I don't pray that in a selfish way, but in no way, shape, or form do I want anyone to think that I'm preaching at them and not to myself. So I would ask, God, that the work begin with me. I would ask today, God, that you would help us to be the people of God that you've called us to be in service to you, set apart. Even though we're in this world, we're not of this world. Even though, God, we're contaminated by worldly things, we don't have to allow them to remain. We can come to the cross of Calvary and ask for your forgiveness and walk in the freedom and the liberty that Christ alone provides. With heads bowed and eyes closed this morning, Right before we open the altars for a season of prayer, I want to ask this morning with no one looking around, please, if you're here today and God's been speaking to you, and I'm going to begin by, first of all, giving a call for someone perhaps who doesn't know Christ is your Savior. If you're here this morning and you've never known the Lord, you've never realized your need for asking for forgiveness of your sins and inviting Christ back into your heart, but today, God's been speaking to you. He's been knocking at your heart's door. And you realize his desire to forgive you of your sins and to come into your life as your personal Savior. You've tried other things. They haven't worked out. But today, God is saying, today's your day. You're looking for peace. You're looking for joy. You're looking for happiness. It's found in me. If that's you, I'm going to ask you right where you are just to simply raise your hand and say, Pastor Jeff, I know I'm a sinner. I know I can't save myself. I know I need to ask Christ for forgiveness of my sins. And today I want that to be the day. Today's my day. I need Jesus. Would you simply raise your hand right where you are? Yes. Yes. Are there others? Yes, I see that hand. Are there others? You need Christ today. God's speaking to you. This is a very personal thing. Don't worry about what the person beside of you is doing. Pray for them. If there's a need there. But at the same time, this is something personal between you and Jesus. Two hands have already gone up. Who else? You need the Lord this morning? You want to ask Christ into your life? God's been speaking to you. He's been challenging you. Anyone else before we move on? I'm going to ask another thing, and that's this. As we've been speaking and as we've been preaching and bringing forth the truth of God's word, God's been speaking to you, and you would say, Pastor, I, I confess there are things in my life that I need to weed out. There are things that have held me back. There are things that have tempted me. There are things that uh, not only tempted me, but I've yielded to, and I've allowed them to creep back into my life, and, and I realize that in the life of a good Christian, they shouldn't be there. But today, I want to confess those things to the Lord, and I, I want to have a pure heart, pure hands in God's presence. If that's you, would you raise your hand? We want to pray together with you. Yes. Hands are going up all over. Yes. 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 Absolutely, we see those hands, yes. And put them down, yes. I'm going to ask you to do me a favor this morning as a congregation. If you're physically able, would you come and join me here around the altars? And those of you that are first ones up, just pressing closer so there's room for everybody. But if you're physically able, would you come and join me here at the altar for just a season of prayer? Go ahead and move on in if you would, please. There's more people still coming. I want to make room for everybody. I want you to know something this morning. I know most of you that are here. 
God has placed a love in our hearts for this community and for you like I can't put into words. I was speaking to a pastor friend of mine on Friday. I met him. And he was sharing with me how God had shown him that we have so many in the church today that are asleep. So many in the church today that, that are not taking the word of God seriously. They're not looking at it for what it is saying. A lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. And in particular there where David says, Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. There's a lot of things that are going on in the church today that should not be here. There's a lot of things, and, and, and this grieves me to say it, but there's a lot of things that are taking place in the lives of pastors that should not be taking place. And I don't say that to put me up on a pedestal because Lord knows I, I make mistakes. I'm not saying that, but it grieves me to think that as a gospel presenter that many are not taking it serious, the responsibility we have. Folks, we're talking about eternity. We're talking about eternity. I can't even begin to fathom how long that is. But I, I take it very seriously, being a pastor. I take it very seriously every time I stand behind that pulpit that when I present the word, I'm not just saying words, but hopefully I'm challenging, hopefully I'm pointing out to you the necessity of having a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not just on Sunday, but every day of the week. And allowing him to make the changes in me, making the changes in you, that need to take place. And I believe that if we'll get serious about serving God, that God's going to honor that and that we can see revival again. You believe that? I mean, I would hate to think, I would hate to think that we'll never see revival again. I would hate to think that for a moment. I believe that God is a merciful God and I believe that the door of mercy is still open. And I believe that, that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to a saving knowledge of Christ. So today, some of you raised your hands for salvation. Some of you raised your hands and you said, you know, there's some things in my life's garden that need to be weeded, Pastor. And today, I want to make that right with God. Let's just take a moment right now in the privacy of this moment. You know your heart better than I do. And I want us to just take a moment to do some reflection. Let's take a moment to examine ourselves. And in the privacy of this moment, I want you to just Pray silently, or if you want to pray out loud, softly, however you're comfortable in doing. But if there's something there that needs to be repented of, if there's something there that you need God to do in a spiritual way, let's take a moment to spend some time with the Lord. Can you do that just right now? Just let's take a moment. Father God, right now, oh Lord, search me. Search my heart, Lord. Search my mind. Search my life. Pray, God, that you would indeed, O oh Lord, do a renewing work. I pray, God, that anything that is there, O oh God, that is not holy, that is not pure, that is not set apart in service to you, that Jesus, you would purge it. Do the pruning process, God. Do the weeding that needs to be done. Remove that desire, Lord, and replace it with a desire for you and the things of God. Help me desire to draw closer to you, Lord, in every area of my life. Purify us, God, with your precious fire. Holy Spirit, fall upon us, God. Excite us, O oh Lord, for the things of God as never before. Help us to be the people of God that you've called us to be. And, O oh Jesus, to have an impact on this community like never before. O oh Jesus, guide and direct. Use us for your glory. O oh God, forgive us, Lord. Lord, as I stand here today in your presence, the word that comes to my mind is forgive us, God. Forgive us. Forgive us of our complacency. Forgive us, Lord, of being so nonchalant. Many times in our walk with you that we take you for granted that we don't take it as seriously as we should, what it means to be a child of God, that we don't take the Great Commission to heart 
when opportunity is provided for us to be a witness to someone else? And how many times, God, have I been guilty of allowing little sins to creep into my life and I've compromised? But Lord, today I pray that this would be a day of new beginnings. I pray today, God, this would be a day of deliverance. I pray today, God, that this would be a day of spiritual house cleaning. When I welcome your Holy Spirit into my life, when I throw the doors and the windows wide open, no longer trying to hide things and conceal things behind closed doors that you're already aware of because you're omniscient God, but I've kidded myself, Lord. I've deceived myself into thinking that I can do certain things that you're not aware of. No more games. No more hide and seek. No more compromise, but today totally sold out. Search me, O God, and know my heart, I pray. See if there be any wicked way within me, and Lord, if there is, right now I repent of it with godly sorrow that I've hurt you. Help me to hate sin the way that you hate sin. Help me, O God, to not desire, O Lord, things that are not Christ-honoring and birth within me a desire for you and the things of God. Raise us up as one of many churches in this valley. I pray for my sister churches as well that boldly proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ. I pray for my fellow pastors. Keep them true. Oh God, keep them pure. Keep them holy. Keep them dedicated, Lord, to the call that you've placed upon their lives. That we will boldly proclaim the word of God and know that you've promised us that your word will not return unto you void. Today, Lord, that one that's raised their hand for salvation, I'm going to just ask you as a congregation, would you pray the following prayer with me? Dear Lord, I come today in complete humility, confession, and repentance. I need you, Jesus, like never before, to wash away my every sin, my every transgression. I want you to be my Lord. I want you to be my Savior. I want my name be written in the Lamb's Book of Life, because I believe that you are the only begotten Son of God that takes away the sins of the world. Be my Lord. Be my Savior. I want this gift of eternal life, that I may have a hope of knowing that I will spend eternity with you. Give me the ability, the strength, and the fortitude to remain true to you no matter what. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today, friend, I believe that God is doing some wonderful things in our lives. And I believe that it started. Don't don't let go of it the moment you walk out that door. Don't allow this spiritual mirror that God has confronted you with today. Don't forget about the things that he's pointed out. Repent of them. True repentance. Godly sorrow. Let that happen right here, right now at this altar. But let it be the first step of many in becoming the man, the woman of God that God has called you apart to be. You can do it. Did you hear what I said? You can do it. You're not only a sinner saved by grace, but you are a saint who still sins. And understand that you're a child of the Most High God. And if God be for us, what'd you say? If God be for us? Say it again. If God be for us, we are more than conquerors through Jesus Christ our Lord. Never forget that. It doesn't excuse my mistakes. It doesn't excuse the times that I make errors. But it does give me the knowledge that I can run to the rock of my salvation. The rock of my salvation is none other than Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. Praise his name. Amen.
God bless you. So good to have you in the house of the Lord today. Our praise team is going to close us out with a closing song. I just invite you to join with them in singing before you go your separate ways. Can I ask a favor of you? Will you make it a point to introduce yourself to five people you don't know? Look around. There's five people here you don't know. Introduce yourself to them. Make them feel welcome at the close of the song. All right, at the close of the song. Don't do it now. Do it at the close of the song. Praise team if you would. Lead us.